2011, um, I recorded this lecture in three main stages or phases because there's a lot to cover today. Um, we will be talking about mathematics, especially mathematical logic. We'll be talking about intelligence. We will be talking about perception and we will be talking about cognitive processes. Now, at this uh, stage in our intro to the psychology of consciousness, to this um, introductory approach to what consciousness means in psychology, we need to switch gears a little bit and see how we go from all the theories that we discussed so far and all the experimentations, all the research studies that we analyze, especially in the context of uh, near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, uh, theoretical frameworks um, along the lines of uh, what is consciousness from a computational level, a cognitive level, a neurobiological level, and how this impacts our philosophy, our spirituality, etc. And we will go into the realms of analysis. Now, this is as it implies an introductory course into the psychology of consciousness. So uh, this week's lecture might be a little more difficult than what is usually required in this uh, course, but I really encourage you to uh, relax as much as you can and allow this lecture to just uh, display itself to you. You don't have to observe everything. In fact, a lot of things, unless you are passionate about mathematics and are passionate about uh, statistics and research studies, might not be essential to uh, what you're doing with the course. But it is my duty to indicate uh, to all the students what are the reasons why we quote unquote believe in the results of all the research and all the indication from theory. I never want any students to take my words uh, as a justification for the way we study consciousness, but I want to equip all students with the basic tools to untangle what seems to be the understanding and the interpretation problem when we study consciousness. Now, at the end of the day, I hope that I will be able to equip you with some healthy skeptical mindset towards certain theories and more of a intellectual leverage to, if not demonstrate, at least defend certain theories of consciousness. So this is one of such weeks where we study logic to better understand and defend certain position in the psychology of consciousness. This will be part one, where the main focus will be, as it implies, in mathematical logic, and we'll see how that plays a role in the way we understand our level of intelligence, whether there are multiple intelligences, okay, whether definitions such as crystallized intelligence uh, make sense, okay. And next week, we will continue the conversation more from a perspective of cognition and perception as they apply to the way consciousness displays itself in the world. So without further ado, let's begin. So we will examine some of the elements that we discuss in neuroanatomy, and we will move on to uh, neuroengineering, uh, neuroimaging, uh, developmental uh, neuroscience, and so on and so forth. And this specific discussion has to do with intelligence. Now, when we think about diversity and we think about inclusion, we have to have a solid knowledge of what science has to say about our own um, origin and identity and, and structure and external manifestation, thoughts, emotions. And one of those factors that I would like to bring to your attention today is intelligence. So when we think about intelligence, we think of uh, at least three main elements. We think about the ability to read between the lines, so to speak, intelligal in, in Latin. We mentioned this uh, a few times. We think about uh, testing, so personality testing on one side, but also IQ on the other side, right? So um, intelligence on the other side. And we also mean third, the G factor. So let's see for a second what, what we mean by that. Well, with, the, with the G factor, really, we, we identify psychometrics. And, and to be a psychometrician, you have to do with, with, with statistical analysis and theoretical constructs to make sure that your 
your uh, examination, your, your testing is reliable, valid, it's all the parameters that we mentioned in week one. But, but by jig factor, G really indicates general intelligence or, or general intelligence factor. This is also uh, synonymous with, with the general mental ability. So the idea here is that there are skills that a person needs to perform. It's, it's a construct that, that was uh, created in order to account for these cognitive abilities uh, within a human subjects, so within um, human uh, intelligence. It's a variable that summarizes positive correlation among different cognitive tasks, and it, it reflects the fact that an individual performance on, uh, on one type of these tasks uh, can be uh, comparable, tends to be comparable to that person's performance on, 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 um, on other types of, of uh, similar cognitive tasks. Now, um, this is of course related to IQ, because IQ, general intelligence and, and cognitive ability, are sometimes used interchangeably to refer to, to this pattern, but they're not the same thing. The, the, the G factor usually, in statistical terms, accounts for 40 to 50 percent of the between individual performance differences on, on, on a given um, cognitive test, and, and composite scores, so IQ scores, uh, based on many tests are frequently regarded as estimates on, on the individual standing on the G factor. Okay? So those are, are the, the, the distinct uh, elements. IQ and the G factor are not the same thing. They're both related, of course, uh, in order to monitor these cognitive abilities. And IQ really stands for intelligence quotient or intelligent quotient, which is a term that was coined by Stern in Germany to, to define this type of uh, standardized test for intelligence. So differentiation between uh, usage of this term aside, although they're very important statistically speaking, the central uh, question here that I would like to bring to your attention for the sake of this uh, first discussion is how can we quantify different levels of intelligence, a broader term, in different populations? And this is one of the essential questions in epigenetics. We always think about the nature-nurture debate. So in a course on mind versus body, this really means individual um, subject skill-based activity as opposed to um, hereditary uh, genetic factors. So the question may be how much of this intelligence, this ability can be inherited? And by inherited, do we mean inherited through genetic factors? Do we mean that we inherit that from our family, from our community, from our tribe, from uh, constructs such as um, ethno-racial, ethno-cultural components? or is something has to do with practice, with skills, with exposure. So this is a very, very complex topic, of course, because like almost everything else in, uh, in human uh, existence, and in, in skills and cognitive capacity and emotions and, and all other related processes, the answer tends to lie in between. So there are both nature, so we inherited traits, there are some traits that are inherited, and nurture things that we can learn, things we practice, things we are at least exposed in a context of education and learning and conditioning and so on and so forth. So I'm liking to, I'd like to ask you uh, if you could answer this question. Do you think that human intelligence is more or less learned or more or less given in a hereditary sense? Now, one of the criticism to IQ is the very conceptualization of intelligence and whether the predictive validity of IQ tests are reliable. Now, I would like to separate this notion for a second. A separate fact that there's one of the most predictive powers in, in uh, psychometrics are indeed find, found in uh, intelligent tests. But we are not actually asking about the validity of any specific subtest that might have some overlapping elements with IQ tests or personality tests and think about um, SAT scores or GRE, etc., etc. We're not arguing about the validity of those specific tests derived from IQ testing. I'm interested in hearing your opinion about what you think our intelligence is and how can we account for where our intelligence comes from as human beings. Is it more nature or is it more nurture? Well, this has to do with perceiving, sensing, evidencing, understanding, rationalizing, uh, constructing, demonstrating, analyzing, and many, many other processes that are by definition cognitive, but they're also computational. So uh, in this week, there will be uh, 
a little less room for, um, I would say, transcendental speculation per se, despite the fact that uh, there will be uh, a few things borrowed from uh, abstract mathematics. Um, but uh, I, I hope that you will uh, use the knowledge that you will gain uh, this week to reconstruct some of the assumptions that we made in the previous weeks. So now that you have both the theoretical knowledge, you have the external framework, and now you will add some ingredients that will, to some extent, become the new building blocks for all the arguments you had uh, for or against uh, a dualistic or monistic perspective in regard to the hard problem of consciousness. All right, now you may wonder why does chapter six start with the mind-body problem, a general overview? You might think, well, wait a second, did we talk about the mind-body problem throughout the course? So why is there a need to go back and talk about it in chapter six? What about the previous five chapters and why a general overview? Didn't we discuss different perspective quite in depth so far? Well, you'll be partially right uh, because I, I feel we did a good job uh, overall in, in, in providing evidence for this or that model. But what it's still lacking is a solid mathematical, analytical, logical examination of each model. Uh, we did a good job in providing an overall uh, pictorial, uh, figurative, uh, metaphorical, comparative analysis of different views on the hard problem of consciousness, on the way the mind and the brain interact. But it is very important before we move on to the very last big topic of this course, which will be indeed the triple S model. Uh, it will be important to have a solid mathematical, logical foundation for any of the claims we will make toward the end of this course. Now, uh, Will you have to uh, work on some calculations uh, during this chapter? Well, the answer is no. You will have to understand some of the very basic logical uh, equations and demonstrations as part of this chapter. But uh, by mathematics in this chapter, we do not mean either calculus, algebra, uh, geometry, um, engineering uh, or uh, physics as applied mathematics. We mean mathematics as both logical processes and recognition of patterns. That's the uh, way we will approach mathematics just in this chapter. So uh, once you will have a solid grasp on basic mathematical premises um, uh, and formulas, so very basic math terminology, then you should be able to navigate the content of this chapter quite easily. Now this, by the way, might be a little too easy, too basic for the ones of you that might come from either mathematics, physics, engineering, uh, or other STEM related fields. So bear with me if the uh, introductory part to this chapter, it's not too profound for your current knowledge. Um, I just feel the need to go back to the basics to make sure that the content of this chapter is accessible to all of you. So let's begin right away. Wonderful. In this section, we will be talking about mathematics. Mathematics as a field that has to do with recognition of patterns and more specifically, mathematics as language. So the first thing I would like to mention here is that we will be talking about logic more specifically, mathematical logic. Now, let's begin with an example even before we uh, address some of the basic symbols in logic. So, I have a little statement here with me on a piece of paper and I will read it to you while I will show it to you. So, the statement on the other side is false. That's the first premise, the first thing we know. Now, we will um, turn around put this over and the other statement says the statement on the other side is false. Now we already are encountering a problem because the first statement says something about what's on the other side and vice versa, albeit vice versa it's not a good term in this context. 
So what else can we say? Well, there is a confusion, there is a clash of statement because the statement is connected to the other one in a wrong way, we could say. Let's, let's use that term for now. So um, if this statement says the statement on the other side is false, we cannot assume that what the other side says is actually true because this will clash with the premise. Now, let's see what will happen in another case where the beginning is the same, the statement on the other side is false, so we know, we're expecting that what we are about to read will not constitute truth, but if we turn this, now we have the statement on the other side is true. Now, uh, this is a problem because there's a connection here that doesn't follow. Now, this again uh, constitutes a paradox, and uh, I mentioned a few weeks ago uh, Kurt Gödel and the incompleteness problem, but as you can imagine here, uh, the premise and the outcome uh, are, are clashing. There's, some, there's something that doesn't quite uh, fit in our uh, logical sequence. So one statement says the opposite of what the opposite actually is. So again, the statement on the other side is false means that what we are about to read on the other side cannot be taken as valid, cannot be, rather than valid, cannot be taken as true. Uh, so when we turn around and it says the statement on the other side is true, it means that on the opposite side the claim was correct, so we cannot trust the fact that this one claims that the other one is true. So you see there is a um, continuous, never-ending logical sequence here that will uh, create a problem in our understanding. And this has to do with, of course, um, um, the, uh, the paradox uh, on uh, logical uh, sense and what uh, really Kurt Gödel had to say about uh, the incompleteness theory. But let's begin with some basic um, uh, mathematical uh, logical symbols and then we will venture uh, into some very very basic equations. So we will be talking about statements and we will be talking about properties. Now, of course, one of the important things to keep in mind is that we need to connect multiple statements and we need to define the type that is connected to uh, any of the previously stated elements, okay? So, types. Now, keep in mind what we said about the principle of falsifiability in previous lectures. So, what are statements? Statements are sentences, and statements declare something. So, let's keep this in mind. Statements have to do with declarations, okay? So, they declare, okay? which we can also say they clarify whether something is either true or false, okay? Or rather, to say it better, statements can be proven to be either true or false. So again, they follow a binary system. Okay, so beyond true and false statements, we also need to clarify the fact that there are statements and there are non-statements, okay? Now, in the context of um, mathematical logic, uh, a good way to uh, think about this is that certain statements are sentences that don't apply to our principle of falsifiability, so they are not constructed on a binary code. So questions are non-statements. For instance, uh, can I use logic um, in the context of a question such as, do you think it will rain today? Well, this is constructed as a question, do you think it will rain today? So this will not be a statement from the perspective of mathematical logic. So, but let's, let's use this as an example, because let's assume that we want to um, um, have a logical examination of the possibility that it might rain today, or so, something about the fact that it's going to be a rainy day. So, 
Let, let's just write here for a second. Rain today. Rain today with a question mark. Okay. And then we will add something else. Um, for instance, um, drive slowly. All right. So let's add something else now that is different. It's also a non-statement. Okay, but it's not a question. Drive slowly. Okay. So one of the ways to look at mathematical logic is verifying whether something can be proven to be true, and this has to do with mathematical proofs, and we have to connect, in this case, two statements. How are we going to do this? Well, the first thing to keep in mind is that we need to rearrange those statements to make it logical. Not logical because they are in themselves illogical outside of the sphere of mathematics, but we have to construct them in a way that we can use to verify uh, based on the binary code we mentioned previously. So let's do that. So uh, let, let's assign some letters to uh, these two sentences. And again, this is not as relevant. Uh, I would not say that you have to pick specific letters necessarily, but it was really important to know that at least in mathematics, there are um, certain agreement on which symbols to pick. There might be some variation between textbooks, but for now, let's just assume that uh, the green one is a statement P, okay, so this will be the letter we will assign to it. Let's use a capital P for now. Um, and then the blue one will be, uh, let's say, a Q, for instance. Okay, P and Q will be uh, the two uh, statements. Now, again, we already mentioned these are non statements from the perspective of logic, so let's uh, recreate uh, our analysis by changing the way they are uh, semantically structured. So our P, okay, our P, now will be today rains, okay? So this is a statement in a logical sense. And our Q will be I drive slowly, okay? Now, of course, there might be some more uh, issues with this because using an adverb, okay, might constitute a problem in itself simply because it's predicated upon a how-ness rather than a zero or one binary code, okay? It would be much easier if it says today it rains and I drive rather than I drive slowly or rather this will require a further um, um, analysis from the logical perspective. So let, let's try to connect these two. Okay, so the first, um, the first uh, mathematical logical symbols that I want to uh, present to you is the AND symbol. So if we sum up P and Q, we could say that Today rains and I drive slowly will constitute this and so today rains and and I drive slowly. Okay? Let's try to convert this to something that actually is more logical from our perspective. So today range is P and I dress slowly is Q. Okay? So we can remove this now. Now, is and sufficient? Well, in general, in logic, we will not spell it out we will use symbols such as this one, this one, or this one, okay? So all these three mean and. P and Q, P and Q, P and Q. Again, today it rains and I drive slowly. Now, I would not advise you to use this one a lot because it's, 
it's not um, it's too confusing and obviously it does not apply only to mathematical logic and of course just just FYI this and the symbols is a contraction of two symbols uh, written in a medieval Gothic alphabet at in Latin okay and if you write at long enough you will get this symbol okay so it's just, it's just pretty much an et which is Latin for and okay uh, the dot here could also be confusing because in some textbook it's utilized for multiplication so perhaps this is the symbol that I will use uh, in this um, explanation in this brief discussion so to rephrase everything at this point we will have P and U, right? So P and Q, uh, again, this symbol, uh, just you know, for, for uh, clarity, is called either the carrot, which is not something you eat, okay, C-A-R-E-T, or circumflex. In the first case, carrot comes from carere, which is Latin for uh, is lacking, is separated, and something that you will utilize in the context of uh, uh, amanuensis writing, for instance. For a circumflex, we use this more in linguistics, um, especially to uh, distinguish the length and type of a vowel, okay? Um, in, in Slavic languages, you might have the opposite, which is the opposite, the, the uh, accento circumflesso rovesciato will be uh, something like this, like the difference between the ch and the ch, for instance, okay? Um, in Cyrillic, this one. So, uh, and or carrot or circumflex is the term, the logical symbol that we utilize to um, to uh, discuss this P and uh, Q. All right. Um, so, and so this is uniting something, and it, it's a conjunction. So it's a type of statement that uh, we uh, define as such. And it, it, so each of these statements are simple statements. Okay. But the end is a conjunction, okay? Conjunction, okay? Carrot. Now, there are, of course, other types of uh, statements uh, that uh, will be linked in a different way. So, if by conjunction we mean uniting together, and now, of course, you will have the disjunction, okay? This junction that is no longer an A, but it will be an OR, okay? Now this OR, uh, it's the opposite of, well, it's the opposite uh, aesthetically speaking, so it's, a, it's the wedge or reverse carrot, and uh, it really looks like a V. So for instance, if you want to say, uh, today uh, rains or, let me use the different color here, today rains or, I drive slowly, okay, I would now write P wedge or reverse carrot Q, so P or Q. Now, um, those are statements that um, are pretty basic and uh, one of the things that we want to keep in mind is that we need to figure out a way to demonstrate whether this is true also on the premise that independently P and Q are true. How are we going to do this? Now we need to uh, identify a truth table. Now we will uh, leave the philosophical discussion on what truth actually means in the context of mathematics um, in, in, the next, uh, in the next lecture, but for now let's just see how this table actually works. So let's start with the end first. Let's start with the conjunction, okay? So our assumption is that um, today it rains, it rains today, and um, I drive slowly are independent statements. So again, I'll write it here. Today rains. The 
rearranged and I drive slowly, okay? I get become P and Q, okay? And now we'll see what happens with both conjunction and disjunction. So let's begin with the conjunction, okay? So we have this element, this statement, okay? And then we have this element, okay? Let's do this. So, if P and Q is true, we will have to identify the truth for each of these statements. So let's remove the wash here and just leave P and Q and create a third column here, okay, where P and Q are actually linked together by a conjunction, okay? Let's do this. So let's assume that P is true, okay? T. Today it rains, or it will rain, okay? Let's also assume that Q is true, okay? I drive slowly, so they are both true, and they are both true, so since there is a conjunction here, the conjunction itself will be true as well. What will happen if P is true? but Q is false. At this point, one is wrong, one is false, and the other is true. Therefore, this one does no longer hold true. So this will be false as well. Again, conjunction. Third possibility. P is false, but Q is true. Okay. Again, it is not true that today rains, okay? Or rather, today rains, it's a false statement, true? And I drive slowly is true. However, because of the conjunction, this will also be false, okay? Third element, th uh, sorry, the fourth, uh, fourth possibility, they are both false, and of course, since they are both false, this turns out to be false. Wonderful. So let's redo this. Okay. We'll recreate our table. Okay. But this time, rather than conjunction, we will use the disjunction. Okay. So I get the disjunction as the wedge. Okay. So same thing. P and Q, and then P or Q. Same thing. Wonderful. Okay. Great. So let's as so let's use two different colors for clarity. So P is true, but Q is false. Okay. Since we're talking about either or, this turns out to be true. Either or. What is the opposite? If P is false, but Q is true. Same thing. We're talking about this junction here, so this turns out to be true as well. I changed the order, of course, from the previous one, so let's assume that they are both true. Now, the wedge simply says that as long as one is true, you are all set, so to speak, so this will also be true. What if they are both false? Okay. Well, 
Well, in this context, unfortunately, since at least one has to be true because of the or, because of the disjunction, this statement turns out to be false. All right? And this is how you create a truth table for um, conjunction and now for disjunction. Now, of course, when we're talking about or, when we talk about disjunction, we should also uh, specify the difference between um, sufficient and necessary as conditions. Uh, but we will do this a little later. So let's continue with some basic symbols, okay? And we will apply truth table to uh, those symbols as well to verify the claim. So we can we can stick to these two examples here, okay? So again, we already mastered the first one. So the end, the end is P and Q, okay? Then we followed up with the or, okay? And we wrote P or Q like this. Now, of course, we have two different types of or. One is inclusive and the other one is exclusive. So let's take a look at the symbols first. For the inclusive or, inclusive or, all right, we will have P or inclusive R, okay, so either P, sorry, either P or Q, my apologies, either P or Q, okay? Now, either P or Q, but since it's inclusive, it means that the, the way you, you, you create this sentence is um, uh, either Q or P or both. So either P or Q or both, so that's the difference, okay? To be more specific. How about the exclusive or? So the exclusive or represents an exclusion so either P or Q, but not both. I'll just do it this way, okay? Okay, so this is an inclusion because it can be either or or both, and this is an exclusion because it can be either or but not both at the same time. At the same time, not chronologically speaking, but simply logically speaking. Uh, wonderful, but what if any of these letters actually are assumed to be a negation? What if, it, if it's, it's, the, it's, it's an assumption that it's a not uh, P or not Q, okay? which is not the, the reverse, okay? We have to be careful here. So um, if you want to use a negation, we will use the term not, okay? So a negation is reversed truth value, okay? So, so to clarify, a negation is a simple statement, but it's a simple statement with a reverse truth value, okay? So let's see how it looks. So, uh, simple statement, so and or, now we'll do not right here, okay? Either you can write something like this, P, or you can write it like this. Okay, I prefer the second one, this one here, because this symbol here very often is used in different ways. Um, depending on what mathematical uh, textbook you follow, I, I see this one to infer similarity, and that is actually not correct from the perspective of logical mathematics, so I'll much rather use these symbols to say not P. For instance, uh, um, not today rains, okay? Or not I drive slowly. Careful here, the fact that I put a not in front of it it doesn't mean that they drive fast or faster, okay? It simply means that it's a negation, okay, of this statement, okay? And again, negation does not mean um, claiming that the statement itself is false, okay? So it's a not um, uh, within simple statements. Okay, let's continue because we have a few more to discuss. 
All right, now we have, of course, those were all uh, simple statements. Um, now we have conditional and biconditional statements. So we, within conditional, we can say that it, it's, a, it's a statement that follows the if-then type of structure, and biconditional, uh, as the name implies, it will be a statement that uh, establishes a two-way uh, truth between, um, two-way truth uh, relationship between the two statements. So let's, let's do, let's make some room here, okay? So conditional, conditional is represented by the symbol either an arrow or horseshoe, okay? Whichever you prefer. So if P, then Q. Okay, so in the example above, if today it rains, then I will drive slowly, which kind of makes sense intuitively in terms of the statement itself, okay? Um, now, biconditional, biconditional, Conditional is represented by this symbol. So this one, or you can also use this one. Okay, great. So what do we use by conditional? Well, in the example above, if and only if. Okay, now, um, I will drive slowly if and only if today rains. What about the opposite? Today it will rain if and only if I drive slowly. So you see already a, a more uh, profound layer of interpretation, which also connects the statement to temporality. If you remember what we said about uh, Heidegger and Hegel, that's where everything comes together. So the sequence itself is as important as the way we create our statement. Now, I forgot to mention that uh, if and only if, very often it's written with double Fs, so IFF, if and only if. This is another way to uh, represent um, a biconditional statement. Okay, so there's a, a lot uh, more to say about this relationship, but I want to uh, give you a brief list of the um, mathematical symbols that we will utilize the most in logic, so um, let's start with one of the most commonly utilized, uh, the, the symbol that um, almost defines equations uh, in themselves, it's the symbols of equality, which is this one, of course, okay, equality. which of course means that uh, it's equal to, okay? X equals Y. Let's continue. How about if it's approximately equal? Well, you will use this wave-like symbol, okay? So, approximately equal, okay? So, for instance, X and y are almost equal. Now you might have uh, seen these three lines here, okay? So similar to equality, but at, at this point um, we, we, we have a, a, the definition of the definition. So th this, this symbol is utilized for definition, definition, okay? And how are we gonna read it? Uh, well, x is defined as another name of y. Okay? And again, we're talking about statements here. So if you want to use P and Q or P and R or S and P for any of this, rather than X and Y, that is perfectly fine. All right, what if this is uh, an inequation? Well, as you would imagine, the symbol is like this, okay? 
and this is of course defined as such in equation okay which simply means that um, if x uh, is not equal to y that do not represent the same thing they do represent the same value fantastic so let's continue now the more than and less than I feel it's something that is pretty straightforward so we can we can skip that um, or much less much more than that we can also skip that one um, I would like to continue though with few or greater than right with, with the with the, with the, um, or smaller than those are also pretty straightforward but those are the ones first four are the one that we are most interested in um, and, and perhaps your know, proportionality as well will be one of, of such terms that we we need to use proportional to okay because um, because th th that that is connected to the the, the, the theory we will be we'll be discussing I mean another one that I feel we should mention is congruence Okay, whether whether something is uh, congruent to, and this symbol is like this. Okay, so congruence, congruence. Okay, and uh, congruence in this context means that um, if uh, x is congruent to y, then shape x is congruent to shape y. Uh, so this has to do with, with measurements. Uh, next, I would like to uh, show you just the difference between these uh, three symbols uh, because we will be utilizing that in the context of uh, theory of perception and neuroscience. So one symbol is this one, one symbol is this one, and another symbol will be this one. Okay. Now these two both represent set membership, okay? So set membership. But this one means is a member of. And this one, as you'd imagine, is not a member of, okay? Okay. Of this set. Now, what about the third one here? What about this symbol here? Well, this one means is a proper subset of. All right, so what's different between these two? Let's just make some room here. What's the difference between these two symbols. All right. Well, this is only for one element, while this one is for a set. Okay. Just keep the, this in mind. So again, it's very important to understand uh, what we mean by certain symbols that are, as I mentioned, um, agreements upon which symbol to use. But if there's any uh, uncertainty about the, uh, what the symbol actually means, simply because you have different models, then please you utilize the one that has less room for misinterpretation. So uh, earlier I mentioned the tilde, right? The, the negation symbol, and I mentioned you can use either this symbol here or this one. And, and by the way, uh, the term tilde really uh, comes from titulus, titulus, or titolo in Italian, okay? Which has to do with title, of course. But if these uh, both represent negation, then I would prefer this because this one also means similar to and so this symbol in this other interpretation is connected to this symbol okay which in turn is connected with this symbol and eventually with this symbol okay so this of course has nothing to do with negation in this context and i'll be very very careful in utilizing the tilde uh, in this shape rather than in this shape for this very reason all right great so um some more uh, comparisons here. Okay, a few more things uh, regarding um, uh, relations concerned with inclusions. So uh, we mentioned a few of this, um, but I feel that we should specify 
uh, a few more things, okay? So let me add uh, the comparison between these four symbols here. So in the first one, we see that every element of A is an element of B, okay? So that's the first example here, okay? Every element of A is an element of B, which means that uh, A is included um, in B or um, A is a subset of B. Let's move on to the second one right here. So with this one, with this one, we mean that B includes A, okay? All right? With this one, we mean that B includes A, or B is a superset of A. So look at the direction here, okay? Again, if you remember what we said earlier about the arrow, so this one has the direction, and this one has this direction. Please, please do not confuse this symbol with this symbol, okay? We're talking about the arrow here. So you could say that this one, this annotation, okay, with this um, uh, order, uh, means this one with this annotation here in this order, okay? Great, so we talked about directions, so let's uh, move on to the very last one, the last pair of these symbols. If we were to write something like this, what we really mean is that Every element of A, okay, every element of A is an element of B, and there is an element of B that is not an element of A, which of course is connected to the uh, broader uh, utilization of the meaning of this symbol, okay, which is of course not A, C. All right, starting with the hypothesis A1. Let's uh, visualize this one. Now, uh, we start from a reductionist equation, so to speak, and we will hypothetically assign the coefficient x and y okay. to mind and matter, respectively. Now, of course, the main difference between the two uh, hypotheses, the H model here, is whether uh, this, uh, these two variables are actually equal, um, not necessarily identical. Now, um, in the equations that uh, we report here, this material equivalence presents two added aspects. A, it poses a biconditional logical connective in the second case uh, between X and Y, thus an if and only if carrying necessity and sufficiency in B, it involves further investigation on the constants of balance versus value, again, in proposition, propositional uh, logical terms. This is connected again to Heidegger, uh, Heidegger um, in, um, in relation to the essential being of matter versus mind. In other words, this if and only if presupposes at least two moments, either temporal, chronological, or spatial between A, the observation on X, and spatial between the observation of y and two or b between the first primary observation of x and y and the second secondary observation of x and y so let's continue uh, we're talking about um, union of sets here so in u2 we can see that a weak equivalence between x mind and y matter is united to a strong equivalence between these two variables while in u3 we observe an intersection of these two levels of strengths however Applying this significance in the context of consciousness would mean that the same order of magnitude found in this connection would account for an approximation based on logarithmic calculation. Well, the isomorphism defined its equivalency would mean that the mind and matter are structurally identical. Now, in all this union of sets, so U2, U3, U4A versus U4B, the idea is to define whether um, mind and matter are structurally identical. So to, um, to quantify matter, to, uh, to, to see how mind and matter could be at least mathematically connected by computational relation, or in other words, via the analysis of computational balance, providing the same number for both entities. We talked about uh, base 10 logarithm. Now, saying instead that mind and matter are structurally identical is actually going beyond their mathematical number, or that in a holomorphic sense, hyal and form present the same structure.
to clarify, I do not expect students to remember these equations, but get a grasp on the general conversation, how to demonstrate the connection between mind and matter. Okay, great. So um, we need to verify the following. Great, so um, now since we're talking about the realm of hypothesis here, we talked about um, mathematics, logics, uh, the assumption here is that we can theoretically create a separation between X and Y to verify the existence of such separation, which appears to be a contradiction in terms based on all the premises. Now things are complicated by the fact that not only the separation might be an artificial one, but also that this artifice to obtain such results is created by the observer, by the decision maker, or by the observation slash decision making method, by the cutoff method. Thus, we should at least attempt to calculate the probability that each of these solutions might actually be close to truth, uh, truth sorry, in a statistical approximation sense. Uh, so we could start uh, you know, by, by verifying each of the hypotheses, the probability, uh, for each of the hypotheses, HA1, HA2, and HP, um, in the following way. So um, there are five different um, steps, five different ways. A, uh, the probability of X, thus limiting the investigation of whether there is enough warrant for independence and existence of mind. And uh, my apologies, in, in the slide um, I mentioned um, that, that there is a mi misspell, it says ether uh, rather than there. Uh, B, PRY, that's the need investigation of whether there is enough warrant for independence exists of matter. C, probability of HA1 for identity, structural, computational, etc. D, P, P, a probability of HA2 um, for material equivalence by conditional logical connective in terms of a necessity sufficient for existence. And the last probability for HP for equivalence as opposed to equality. Again, since we're talking about a possible comparison between computation and structure, again, Heil versus form, and probability p-value, it might be appropriate to remove or at least account for fixed significance thresholds as opposed to incremental values. This will mean interpreting our results as grades or degrees, um, as well as steps or, or stages of the strength of evidence of existence against a null hypothesis. We should at the same time be very careful in not assigning value to the value mathematically speaking, given that our investigation is about the parameters which would help us define the existence of mind and matter as either completely separate entities, combined or interacting entities, or if we should only talk about one entity, interpreted with features appearing connected to a mind-body series of processes or activities, or a matter-based series of processes or activities. Again, in um, HC, the arrows are bidirectional, thus implying mutual implication between mind and matter. This view represents the core of dualism from, from this specific perspective, although to better define which type of dualism we're talking about, we suggest we operate a further split from the, the, this level to the secondary level. Um, and, and again, talking about dualism, there's you know many that we previously discussed, substance dualism, predicate, property, dualism, but also epiphenomenalism, interactionism, occasionalism, universalism, etc. In the last part of this analysis, we compare again um, our table uh, uh, on page 158 uh, um, and the theories uh, that uh, we mentioned regarding uh, Kerner, McGinn, Taylor, Wolfram, uh, also in connection to Ishikawa, and in Ishikawa's uh, perspective of linguistic limits, limitation, um, in connection to worldview limits, measurements, and measure. And of course, the measure issue goes all the way back to the measurement axiom and uh, the analysis of uh, Ishikawa, of course, but also uh, the analysis of Schrodinger, starting from the Hamiltonian operator H, define the system's total energy, set spectrum possible outcomes uh, when there is a measurement um, or the total energy of a system. To clarify, I do not expect students to remember these equations, but get a grasp on the general conversation how to demonstrate the connection between mind and matter. So you might wonder, uh, what, what's the value in learning all these equations, despite the fact that, yet again, I'm not expecting you to memorize any of these equations. 
um, what's the value to better understand um, mind and body connection? Well, this chapter talks about perception and cognition. Um, and I hope to uh, have um, had the chance to, to indicate how our perceptual factors have um, a lot of connection with the way we interpret the world, the way we think about the world, cognition, and in turn, the way we think about the world influence the way those very things are entering the system, are um, per being perceived by our system. And I mentioned uh, the connection with the social economy theory and, and and, and the model proposed by, by Bandura, you can find this on page 166 and 167. Um, and and, and, and this uh, is something that is related because we reconsider a three-dimensional conceptualization of the mind-body problem. Uh, and, and this uh, triangle would immediately make us think of, of Trinitarian theories, especially in a metaphysical or even theological sense, when you think about the Trinity, but also in relation to the physical dimension of structural features, for instance, the double helix of the DNA. Um, and you probably all know um, the work by, 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 by Francis Collins, who focused on the human nature, on the divine origin of evolution, on the genetic substructure of creation, including uh, humans, and on the moral law, yet again perceived by us humans. And in, in conclusion, uh, it's solely focused on altruism uh, through the philosophical and as at the basis of the research on the Human Genome Project. I will also like to mention specifically in regard to uh, the, the conceptualization of, um, of uh, the the natural and moral law connection that work by, by uh, David Berlinski. Now, the most important aspect of this perspective uh, is the presumed scientific requirement that science demands atheism from within. Um, and, um, and, and, and in other words, science uses itself to claim that it's more scientific to expose a position in which there is no warrant for a God than the other way around. Uh, Collins, again, presents numerous fallacious assumptions of the concept of a deistic versus theistic and personal God or religion, and the same can be said about um, uh, David Berlinski. What, what, what is this, the, the scientific research in terms of empirical studies? Well, uh, there are plenty of, um, of research um, studies that, and, and, and the phenomenon of, of connection between a transcendental nature have been analyzed by, by many scientists. I, I just want to mention yet again the work by uh, Mario Beauregard on the uh, altering state of mind, by Moore, Jansen, Van Lon um, on near-death experiences, the model that we mentioned a few times uh, on consciousness by, by uh, Roger Pamaros and, and, and Stuart Hameroff, um, the research by Stevenson on reincarnation, and many, many, many others. But of course, what is missing and what's truly transcendental in my mind, even spiritual and metaphysical, is the fact that none of these small parameters, rather these small parameters, were separated from each other, cannot create consciousness. So there is something, there must be something more um, that is equivalent to more than the sum of its parts. In this regard, I want to mention the quote on page 187. At the end of his scientific career, Penfield concluded that higher mental functions, such as consciousness, reasoning, imagination, and will, are not produced by the brain. Mind is a non-physical phenomenon interacting with the brain. Wonderful. So we will stop here as far as um, mathematical logic. Uh, there are certainly more things to, to discuss, and we will continue our conversation. But uh, for now, those are just the basic uh, parameters that I want students to be uh, more familiar with. Uh, also, in order to understand the overall um, theoretical frameworks for, for this specific chapter, which is one of the uh, most dense chapter in the textbook. So uh, we will continue with the next topics. Well, uh, a lot to digest this week. Uh, I hope uh, I was able to present all these topics in a, uh, if not easy, at least clear way. Uh, as usual, please feel free to email me uh, your questions, thoughts, and comments. Uh, but otherwise, I will leave you with this, and I will see you all in week 12. Bye-bye.